Hi there, everybody. This is going to be a very, very crash course on chemical equations, balancing equations, stoichiometry, limiting reactant, and percent yield. For the limiting reactant, I'll actually have a separate video that you can watch, and I'll link that at the end, but the rest of it will be in this video. So we're going to talk about chemical equations first, then balancing those, then using balanced equations to do uh, stoichiometry problems and uh, percent yield in actual real life uh, reactions. So first off, let's just talk about balance, uh, balanced equations and chemical equations. If you recall, chemical equations are simply representations of um, reactions that take place in real life. So for instance, if I took some magnesium and put it into some hydrochloric acid, magnesium symbol is Mg, and magnesium uh, by itself is a solid. And so the parentheses S here, lowercase s, means that it's a solid. I put that in hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is HCl, if you recall. And uh, acids are aqueous. And so AQ in parentheses means that they're aqueous. I don't have to stress too much about that right now. We'll deal with that later on when we get to chemical reactions in a, more, in a bigger way. Then we put an arrow, which means it produces, it yields, uh, is what this arrow means. And so magnesium reacts with, which is what this plus sign means, hydrochloric acid, yielding or to produce. And then this is, and again, you don't have to know this quite yet, but this is a single replacement reaction. So magnesium is going to bond to chlorine. Magnesium's two positive and chlorine's one negative. So it's gonna take two chlorides to bond to that magnesium. And if you look at your solubility chart, magnesium chloride is aqueous. And then the hydrogen is gonna go off on its lonesome way. If you recall, hydrogen is a diatomic element. If you don't remember the diatomic elements, Brinkelhoff, B-R-I-N-C-L-H-O-N-F. Those are the elements that are diatomic. So when hydrogen's by itself in its elemental state, it's diatomic like that. So is bromine, so is iodine, so is nitrogen, chlorine, hydrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. Okay, so that's our chemical equation representing the reaction between magnesium and hydrochloric acid. If you'll notice, it violates the law of conservation of mass. We have one magnesium atom that we're starting with, but uh, I'm sorry, we have one chlorine atom that we're starting with, and then it magically became two chlorine atoms. You can't do that. Um, that is not uh, possible in, in life. And so we've got to figure out where that chlorine came from. So let's go ahead and try this out. We have one magnesium atom on the left, and we have one magnesium on the right. So as far as balancing, those are balanced. Balance just means we have the same number of atoms we're starting with that we're ending with. When we look at hydrogen, we have one hydrogen atom on the left, and then magically it became two hydrogen atoms. That can't happen. We need two hydrogen atoms to start with to get to the two hydrogen atoms at the end. So we're gonna put a big number in front. If you recall, it's called a coefficient. This is a coefficient of two, two hydrogens. We're saying we have two of this entire molecule that are going to react with the Mg. That means we have two hydrogens, which is where these two hydrogens came from. Then, because it's two HCLs, we have two, we have two CLs also. So that's where these two CLs came from. So if we look at the whole thing, it is now balanced. There's one Mg, one Mg, two Hs, two Hs, two CLs, two CLs. It's balanced. So now it follows the law of conservation of mass. Let's try another one and uh, see how it is. This one's a little bit harder. So let's say we have aluminum nitrate, aluminum bonded to nitrate. Aluminum is three positive, if you look on your periodic table. Nitrate is one negative, if you look at your polyatomic ion sheet. So it's gonna take three of these nitrates to bond to it, to the aluminum. And let's say that we have this dissolved in water, so it's aqueous, okay? Now let's react this with another compound. Let's react it with sodium carbonate. And sodium's one positive, carbonate is two negative. So it's gonna take two sodiums to bond to the two negative uh, carbonate. And again, this one we're gonna have dissolved in water, so it's gonna be aqueous also. If you recall, this is called a double replacement reaction, a compound reacting with a compound. You don't need to know that quite yet, but eventually. Okay, so the aluminum and the sodium will swap places, so the sodium will now be bonded to the nitrate. Sodium is one negative, I mean one positive, nitrate is one negative. So they already bond in a one-to-one -one ratio, that's the formula. And if you look on your um, solubility chart, it's aqueous. 
When the aluminum bonds to carbonate, it's a little more complicated. Aluminum is three positive, carbonate is two negative. So it's going to take two aluminums and three carbonates to make a neutral compound. Okay, so that's our compound. And if you look on your solubility chart, this is going to form a solid, a precipitate. If so if we put these two compounds together, these two solutions together, we're gonna to make a precipitate of aluminum carbonate. So that's the equation for the reaction, but now we need to balance it. So we're just gonna take one element at a time or, or, or polyatomic ion at a time. So we have one aluminum on the left and we have two aluminums on the right. So that's not balanced. So we need to put a coefficient of two in front, two aluminums, two aluminums. We have two times three, which is six NO3s. So over on the right, we need six NO3s. So I'm gonna put a big six in front, a coefficient six in front. Now we go to our next element. We have two NAs and six NAs. So what times two will give me six? Of course, you should have said three. So three times two is six, which balances the six. And then we have three CO3s, which balances with the three CO3s. So now we have balanced everything. All the ions are the same on the left as they are on the right. Um, if you do, if you can't balance it, like you get to the end and it just won't balance, you probably have a formula wrong. So go back and check your formulas, make sure that you have your formulas correct. So that's a real quick reminder about balancing equations. So next we're gonna talk about stoichiometry, but to do that, I wanna remind you about the mole. Remember, um, these coefficients tell you the mole ratio of how things react and how things are produced. So when these two substances react, two moles of aluminum nitrate will react with three moles of sodium carbonate. That produces six moles of sodium nitrate and one mole of aluminum carbonate. So these coefficients in front are mole ratios. So if we ever wanna know how much reactants going to react, how much product is going to be produced, we've gotta know something about moles. So let me remind you what the mole can be converted to. So first off, the mole, abbreviated MOL, because that E is just too hard to write, uh, but the mole can be converted to number of particles. And that's the definition of the mole. That comes from Avogadro's number. If you recall, Avogadro's number is what the mole is defined as, and uh, one mole is equal to 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles, where particles means atoms, if you're talking about an element, means molecules, if you're dealing with a molecular compound, it means uh, formula units, if you're dealing with an ionic compound, uh, but particles uh, just has to do with what are the fundamental uh, units of the substance that you're dealing with. So we can convert moles to number of particles using Avogadro's number. That's probably the one you use the least because we usually don't need to know how many particles are in a substance. What we do use a lot is mass or grams. I'm gonna go ahead and put grams, but remember grams is a unit of mass. So in order to convert between grams and moles, we use the molar mass and that's on the periodic table. Periodic table tells you how many grams are in one mole of every substance. So it allows you to convert between grams and moles. The other thing we can convert moles into is liters of solution. If you're given the molarity of a solution, molarity is equal to moles per liter. And so if something is 2.4 molar, that means that there are 2.4 moles in every one liter of the solution. So we can convert between moles and liters if you know the molarity of the solution you're talking about. There are other things the mole can be converted to, but we'll deal with those later. We're not quite there yet. Now, in stoichiometry, we're not just inter interested in one substance. We're interested in how substances react and how products are produced. So we want to go from moles of one substance, maybe a reactant, maybe a product, to moles of a different substance. So I'm gonna put a little A here, meaning moles of whatever substance we start with, and then B right here for converting the moles of a different substance from the balanced equation. So the balanced equation allows us to convert between moles of one substance and moles of another. And then of course, we can convert to all these other things that we talked about earlier, moles of particles, grams, 
mass, and liters of solution using the same conversion factors we talked about earlier. And this is molarity. I didn't write that in, molarity. So let's go ahead and try a stoichiometry problem using um, this little chart that I've given you to maybe help you out if, you, if you're a little rusty. So here's our first problem. I'm going to leave the chart up at the top. And our first problem tells us we have 32.4 grams of magnesium, and it reacts with a 1.5 molar hydrochloric acid solution, to, um, and then it produces the products. But we don't care about the products in this. We just want to know what volume of HCl actually reacts with that amount of magnesium. So if you remember from uh, stoichiometry, you always start with the amount of substance you're given. And the amount of substance I given is 32.4 grams of magnesium. You might be confused because you see another number here. And you're like, well, do I start with that? Molarity is always a conversion factor. You're going to use molarity to convert between moles and liters. So it's not the amount you're starting with. It's the conversion between moles and liters. So you'll never start with molarity. So I'm given grams of magnesium. I'm going to convert my grams of magnesium to moles of magnesium because I've got to get to the mole in order to go to another substance. So from the periodic table, 24. 0.31 grams of magnesium is one mole of magnesium. So grams of magnesium cancel. Notice I have the unit in the numerator, the unit in the denominator. They have to be diagonal from each other. They cancel out. And now I have moles of magnesium. So now I can go moles of what I have to moles of what I want using the balanced equation. One mole of magnesium reacts with two moles of HCl. So that's it. One mole of magnesium reacts with two moles of HCl. So moles of magnesium cancel and we have moles of HCl. And then we do another step because we don't want moles, we want liters. Volume is in liters. So we're going to go from moles to liters and to do that we use molarity. So we have the molarity right here which tells us there's 1.5 moles in every one liter. So moles is in, in the numerator. I need to convert moles, 1.5 moles, is one liter of HCl. And that's it. We ended with what we're looking for, liters of HCl. So we're going to multiply across the numerator, divide by everything in the denominator, and when you do that, you should get 1.78 liters of HCl. 1.78. And if we round for significant digits, since this 1.5 is two significant digits, this should be 1.8 liters of HCl. That would be the proper significant figures. And that's our answer. So stoichiometry is simply a, uh, an accounting of how much reactant reacts and how much product is produced. I'm going to do one more stoichiometry problem. You're welcome to stop if you want, but I'm going to do one more stoichiometry problem in case you uh, need it. So here's my second stoichiometry problem. Uh, but this one's going to deal with percent yield. So maybe you shouldn't stop. Percent yield. So let's go ahead and take a look at what this problem is asking. It says the same 32.4 grams of magnesium reacts with excess HCl. And that just means we have all the HCl we need. We're not going to run out of HCl. Um, and then it produces only 1.89 grams of H2. What is the percent yield? So what does percent yield mean? Well, percent yield is simply a way of comparing what you make in an experiment to what you should make theoretically, what you should have made according to stoichiometry. So um, the way we calculate percent yield is taking the experimental yield, and experimental yield just means the amount that you actually make in a, in a uh, reaction, and if you actually carried out an experiment. How much product did you actually make? And then we're going to compare that to the theoretical yield. And the theoretical yield is just the amount that you should have made. When you do the stoichiometry problem, it's the amount that you should have made according to stoichiometry. If everything went perfectly, that's how much you should have made. And then we multiply by 100 in order to make it a percent. So percent yield is this ratio between experimental and theoretical times 100. Now, usually your percent yield is going to be less than 100%. Why? Well, maybe you have some side reactions. Things reacted in a way that you didn't expect. Or Maybe you, uh, in transferring between your containers, you lost some of your yield. You left some behind. It stuck to the container. Maybe you were filtering and some of your product went through the filter. Who knows? But usually your percent yield is going to be less than 100%. Your experimental is going to be less than your theoretical. 
So we're going to go ahead and try this problem and uh, see what we do. Now, if you'll notice, here is our experimental yield, 1.89 grams of H2. That's our experimental yield. That's how much we actually made. So that's what we're going to plug into the percent yield right here for experimental yield. What we need to do is do stoichiometry to calculate the theoretical yield. So to do that, I'm going to start with the amount that I, of magnesium I'm given and figure out how much H2, how many grams of H2 I should have produced. So let's go ahead and do that. 32.4 grams of magnesium. And we're doing the stoichiometry just like we did in the last problem. Uh, 24.31 grams of magnesium from the periodic table is one mole of magnesium. Then stoichiometry, one mole of magnesium reacts to form one mole of hydrogen. So it's a one-to-one -one ratio. One mole of magnesium forms one mole of hydrogen gas. So the moles of magnesium cancel. And then since we, are, we have grams of hydrogen in the problem, we want to convert hydrogen to grams so we can compare the experimental to the theoretical. So one mole of H2, if you look at the periodic table, two H's, adds up to 2.02 grams of H2. And so now we can calculate our theoretical yield. Multiply everything in the numerator, divide by everything in the denominator. And of course, I've done that already beforehand. And uh, that gives us 1.89 grams of H2. I don't know why I said that. That's our, that's our experimental. Um, this gives us 2.69 grams of H2. Sorry about that. So this is our theoretical yield. It's the amount of H2 we should make from 32.4 grams of magnesium reacting. But of course, we only made 1.89 grams in the, in the uh, reaction. So now we can calculate our percent yield. The percent yield is our experimental yield, which is what we made in the experiment, 1.89 grams of H2. And the theoretical yield, how much we should have made, According to stoichiometry, 2.69 grams of H2, multiply by 100. And when you do that, um, and by the way, I'm gonna, I left the whole entire number on my calculator, 2.69, because we don't want to round in the middle of the problem. So leave the entire thing on your calculator and put that in the denominator here. That'll save some rounding error. Anyway, when you do that, you will get 70.2% yield. So what that means is we only made 70.2% of the hydrogen that we should have made. And if you're a, a company making product, that might be really bad uh, because your, your profit depends on how much product you make. You paid for all this magnesium, but you didn't make as much product as you wanted. So this could be a really bad deal. Usually chemists want to make as, the highest percent yield as they possibly can, minimize the errors, minimize side reactions, minimize waste. But this one only made 70.2%. So that's where I'm going to stop here. If you have any questions about chemical equations, balancing chemical equations, stoichiometry, percent yield, molarity, uh, unit conversions, um, or anything else, please contact me so I can help you. There was a lot in here. I do have another video that I've linked that goes over uh, um, limiting reactant. You wanna look at that. Uh, those are the harder problems, and I've given you a practice problem in that. So take a look at that one, it might help you. So that's where I'm going to stop on this. I hope it was helpful. Again, please contact me if you need any help. I will see you later. Bye.